going to start this morning with uh, uh, an address uh, by Dr. Professor Jeremy Chataway, um, who's well known to most of you, but just briefly, he's a consultant neurologist and professor of neurology at Queen Square and at the uh, Queen Square Institute of Neurology. After his medical training, he uh, obtained a PhD from Cambridge in genetic epidemiology of multiple sclerosis. And he's continued to be an active uh, clinician scientist and researcher. He has a particular interest in clinical trial design uh, and is the chief investigator of the MS STAT and MS SMART trial programs. Recently, he's been appointed chief investigator of the MS Society funded Octopus MAMS platform trial in progressive MS. And it's on this topic that he's going to speak to us this morning. Thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, it's a great privilege to come here and to see so many uh, friends and colleagues who've travelled for many, many miles, so that's fantastic. Um, uh, to get back, I guess, to the root problem in multiple sclerosis, which is progression, and our, I guess, limited attempts to do something about it. So progression, of course, we see it most explicitly with walking, but then upper limb function, cognitive function, Plain, pain and bladder function. So progression is the problem in multiple sclerosis. And we, we face a problem in some senses. We've been a victim of our own success. We have many possible molecules and compounds that could have an effect on progression that come out of the laboratories. But our challenge is to trial them. Because until they've reached successful phase three trial, we can't use them. And so one way is to try and get to more efficient trial designs, and I thought I'd just talk a little bit about that uh, with the Octopus program, which is entirely funded by the UK MS Society, and what it's like to set that up and what it is inside uh, moving forward, and many of you are aware of that. So this is one attempt to try and speed up the testing of possible compounds in progressive multiple sclerosis. So we're well aware, and you'd have seen this slide many times, but it's an extraordinary success that we've achieved. I mean, when some of us were young, this was a blank white slide, just using corticosteroids, and physiotherapy for our patients who come in with relapses and spend many days, many weeks in hospital with significant relapses and all of the morbidity that that entailed. And I think perhaps some of the newer trainees or newer consultants can't believe that we have no treatment. We have no treatment. There was no disease-modifying treatment for multiple sclerosis. And if you look at it from beta interferon to the oral agents to monoclonal with more to come, BTK inhibitors, etc., etc., it is quite a remarkable journey. And in my mind, it's one of the two major successes in clinical neuroscience, the other one being stroke treatment. It is quite amazing what's happened over the last three decades. And this, of course, is what we want to replicate in progressive multiple sclerosis, where it's almost, though not, as you'll see, um, a blank white slide in dealing and slowing down uh, progression. So now it's possible to do a trial in relapsing remitting disease of new compounds with each person, each patient, each participant being in trial for about six months. And this is a schema uh, for the phase two trial um, of a new BTKI inhibitor. So you can do these trials in relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis uh, very easily and fluently. Reasons why? Well, MRI provides the keystone of an outcome that gives you confidence in phase two that you can move to phase three. Because as you're aware, there are many, many traps moving from phase two to phase three. And a phase three failure is a very expensive exercise indeed. In pharma terms, probably hundreds of millions of dollars. So the phase two, what is the, if you like, barrier that you feel that you've got success moving from phase two to phase three um, is essential and we have that in the relapsing, remitting uh, paradigm. It's been highly successful over many decades. So progression, and of course there are many problems, many, many problems with progression, and we shouldn't sugarcoat it. Firstly, we have an incomplete knowledge of the biology 
and a number of mechanisms, many mechanisms, can be at play and over many decades. So perhaps at any moment in time, we don't know necessarily in vivo which are the mechanisms. So we are, if you like, we go into this with one hand behind our back. And of course, there can be multiple mechanisms, and some of them are illustrated um, on the left here. Energetics, mitochondrial, ionic fluxes, uh, ongoing inflammation. So many mechanisms help to drive progression, and we kind of codify it in a simple way with the EDSS. And of course, that's imperfect, as we know, but what to do? One can think of sort of baskets of outcome measures, upper limb, lower limb, cognitive, patient-reported outcomes. But you've got to measure something to know you actually have an effect on the progression. And I think the other thing, which sometimes is more subtle, is that we're, we're looking to slow things down to start with. It's highly unlikely we could reverse multiple sclerosis at this moment in time. But slowing will be an amazing success. So preserving upper limb function, cognitive function, will be an amazing success. And that's really what we're trying to do. And I think when you talk to patients into trial, coming into trial, it's very important because they might think, well, why haven't you made me better six months later? Because it's not like the relapsing remitting side where it's obvious you've reduced the relapse activity. So I think that's really important. Otherwise, it leads to disillusionment. Um, as it were, and patients drop out of trial. Why haven't you made me better? We can't make you better. But if we could slow things down, that would be an extraordinary achievement. And uh, we measure it, as you know, with the different steps. And so, sort of in this talk, I'm interested in sort of EDSS 4.0 up to 8.0. Of course, progression probably begins earlier, but it's a reasonable place to start because it's such a massive burden. People with established progression and trying to slow that down would be extraordinary. And so um, a familiar slide encapsulates, I think, triangulates, if you like, the three things we're trying to do. So at the top, an anti-inflammatory strategy. Yes, we've had success in relapsing remitting. Yes, we have some success. We'll show that in progression. And at the bottom, the really difficult things, well, I don't think we have achieved success at phase three. Can we protect the nervous system? That's an enormous ask, of course. Actually get a drug, a drug, a tablet, that gets into the central nervous system and protects it. it protects trillions of neurons. It has an effect on those areas where there's been destruction or demyelination. And thirdly, a holy grail is can you, can you repair like taking a car to, the car to the garage, can you repair it? Can you repair that central nervous system? And of course, many claims are made, um, but doing it in a proven phase three robust way, I think, is a very high bar, and one I don't think we've achieved. But this is the route map, and the clearly one day a patient will be on multiple different therapeutics, perhaps non pharmacological as well, to help achieve these three goals. And perhaps that will be where we are in 10 or 20 years. So let's have a look back, because it's not as if many, many investigators haven't spent many, many years trying to achieve an effect on progression. And probably about, I think we counted up, about 25,000 people have gone through clinical trial. So these are the robust ways to try and ascertain activity, and not surprisingly, it began with the anti older anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive medications, cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide, then into the beta interferon era. Then we have mitoxantrone. Of course, there was a moment in time, a moment in the sun, where mitoxantrone was used quite a lot for progressive MS from the French trial. There were particular side effects. And I think it sort of faded away. But there was a moment when we were using quite a lot of mitoxantrone. And then other compounds, immunoglobulins was very fashionable, a cannabinoid looking for different mechanisms, and myelin basic proteins. So we sort of summarized them here, and there was no therapeutic effect. Sometimes there were glimmers, of course. Um, one of the beta interferon trials suggested an effect on the more inflammatory 
progressive disease. And of course, that's a familiar echo now, isn't it, with the drugs, the two drugs that we use in, if you like, more inflammatory, active progressive disease. And moving up to the last, uh, I guess, seven years, uh, the Fingolimod trial, Natalizumab trial, of course, you know, was there a subgroup there? Well, maybe there's a subgroup, but you've got to do the trial with that subgroup to prove there is an effect. You don't have enough power to look at uh, um, subgroup analysis in that one trial, but it's, it's tantalizing. And then cyclophosphamide came back into use. I'm not sure it's worth reinventing the wheel. I mean, those, tri those drugs were trialed a long time ago and they were negative. So I think one has to move on to new compounds because, as I say, there are no shortage of possible experimental or phase one compounds that could go into clinical trial. And then on the right, I think a very interesting, I thought it was unlikely it was going to work. Um, could biotin, a simple vitamin, make you better? It seemed unlikely. But they did the trial. They did the trial. They didn't say, oh, phase two, that's it. It's over to you. They did the trial, and it didn't show effect. But that bar was very, very high to make someone better with progressive MS. But yes, as you know, the door has been opened, opened twice with ocrelizumab in prime progressive multiple sclerosis and then siponimod in secondary progressive MS. Of course, the effect is very small here. It reduces in relative terms by about 25%, but in absolute terms, it's about 6%. This is not a huge effect. And as you know, depending where in the world you practice, uh, these drugs are used in the more inflammatory a progressive part of the illness because that would seem to be the mechanism of action of ocrelizumab and siponimod. I don't think anyone would say that these are neuroprotective drugs or remyelinating drugs. But it was, it's useful, and I think it's useful in it kind of honed us in on dealing with activity in the progressive part of the illness. So whether it's MR activity or relapse activity, it's honed us in. And now we use these drugs in inflammatory progressive multiple sclerosis. And again, you know, really hats off to the investigators and the companies behind them for driving it through with these medications. And it's rejuvenated the field. Because if a field has too much failure, eventually people become disinterested in pharma or academic investigators, it's very hard. Does it have success? Ignites the field again. And so that's the oratorial curve. And here's the uh, siponimod curve. And so now, I think this is quite a nice diagram. If you like, the, again, the re, not the rethinking, but just reminding us of what we're doing in these subtypes, maybe you merge them together, maybe you don't, but uh, thinking more mechanistically of inflammation and getting rid of that inflammation. If you can see that inflammation, of course we can't see all of inflammation. But conceptually I think these sorts of diagrams are useful and they're helpful when explaining to patients. But of course the familiar cry from patients, and I hear this, I would say, once or twice a week, you're telling me there's no inflammation, but I'm getting worse. And I know I'm getting worse. And you know I'm getting worse. Why am I getting worse? Because non-inflammatory progression is taking place, whatever non-inflammatory progression is. It's really quite a difficult concept, I think, to discuss with patients with progressive multiple sclerosis. Because then you have to start using words like neurodegeneration. And that's quite a difficult word to use, I think, for people with progressive multiple sclerosis. What, my central, my central nervous system is degenerating, is dissolving, and what are you doing about it? So, useful, but the hard question is non-inflammatory, non-active progression, which of course is the elephant in the room. And so, how to get there, how to try and produce compounds from wherever they come to do something about the non-inflammatory component in progression 
in that destructive part of multiple sclerosis, even though you've apparently turned off the activity on the MRI scan. And so we come back to <coughs> our scheme. Oh dear. And so we come back to our scheme, and that's the apex. Let's just talk about those two areas on the bottom, and let's remind ourselves on all of these mechanisms. I mean, could we give people seven different drugs that had an effect at the same time? And some with progressive multiple sclerosis, if they existed, if we could get them into the central nervous system, for sure. I mean, it's a pretty big ask. And of course, we wouldn't know at any one time which mechanism was dominant, if at all. But to try and make some progress by trialling out medications that could have an effect on these different pathways. And of course, we're familiar, aren't we, with HIV treatment, where it's multiple compounds, with hypertension treatment, it's hyper multiple compounds. This is not unknown at all in medicine. It seems unlikely that one drug would just put an effect and stop progression. Unless it came down from the mountain and there, was, there it was. <coughs> I think the other component, well, the two other components, this is the first one, is age. So progression, as you know, occurs with people in their 40s and 50s, and sadly, sadly, some of us in this room are ageing, some more rapidly than the others. And we can't do something about age, I don't think. Maybe we will one day, maybe we could reverse age. And what is ageing? What are the mechanisms behind age? And so there's that kind of loss of reserve, perhaps, central nervous system has a huge reserve, but then that loss of reserve as we age, and we see it in people that don't have a disease as they age. We see it in front of us, don't we, all day long. So that's a component. And if you look at the uh, slide on the right, compared to people that don't have MS, there's an accelerating aging of the, of the brain. And so that's there, kind of working against us. This talk will get more cheery, by the way. That's there working against us. And then also, I think, the effect of comorbidity, particularly vascular comorbidity, but psychiatric comorbidity, such as depression. And these, I think, are the unsung heroes, because these we can do something about right here, right now. And my theory, and I apply it to myself, we don't do enough. Oh, you're a bit hypertensive, oh, your cholesterol's six. Your diabetes, are you borderline diabetic? You're a bit depressed. All of these actually drive, and the epidemiology, particularly from North America, shows it drives the progression. And we can really do something about these, obviously, because we have the simple medications in front of us, but we rely on other people to do it, who then don't do it, That's just, unless you do it yourself. So I'm a, increasingly, this is not just mortality, but also we've done similar word for morbidity. And Ruth Anne Marie, for example, shows that vascular comorbidity drives progression. Can, and I, I wonder if eventually we come to the place where we should be very stringent in our treatment of hypertension, as if someone had had a, had a stroke. And of course, there's a lot of vascular stuff going on in the CNS, in people who have multiple sclerosis. And we can get to grips with this. And I, think, I, th I really do think that should be part of the package using, as we said, multiple therapeutics. And to be honest, putting someone on an ACE inhibitor is a lot simpler than trying out drug A or B. So with that as the kind of preamble, where are we? So a nice uh, summary here, Alan Thompson, Olga Shikarelli. Where are we in the classical trial landscape in progressive MS? So depending where you are in the world, so if you're in the US, for example, then any sort of anti-inflammatory is allowed in progressive MS if there's sign of activity, or perhaps if there's not. So these are all sort of allowed. We're most familiar of course, in the UK with ocrelizumab and siponimod, as I said. But these drugs have come through trial and are used. 
and have been expanded in their remit in North America for any activity. So you can use what you like if there's activity. And then we have the selective ones we've discussed. We have the emerging ones. And then we have a list of interesting um, different me mechanistic um, opportunities um, having an effect on progression from different parts of the, of the biology, if you like. Um, I'm interested in simvastatin. Anthony leads the COGX trial, and so on and so forth. So we have lots of opportunities, and these are these interventions going through their trial stages. This is a very arduous, non-quick process. For example, the simvastatin pro process, which is a repurposed drug that I lead. We probably started the work for that 15 years ago. So even the simplest drug in the world, with basically no side effects, is a very arduous process. And the same will be true in the commercial sector. The discovery of these drugs, the phase, taking them through the phase two and three programs, if there's experimental sets, is enormously arduous. And one can think about how it could be improved. But we tied ourselves a bit up in knots with the regulatory process. But there we are, that's what it is. And so we can't really get there very quickly. As I'll show you, I think some improvement or different thinking in trial design might help. But nonetheless, it takes a long time. And if you look at oncology programs, they're used to lots of failure on the way. And then eventually something comes through. So one way, um, and again, I borrowed, borrowed this from the oncology pr um, um, program, really. Um, a process called a Stampede in Prostate Cancer, which has been immensely successful, led by Max Palmer, who's the director of the MRC CTU, is to use multiple arms. Multiple arms are multiple stages, these so-called adaptive platforms. So you can just roll it on, see a drug that doesn't pass the interim marker, you can drop it and you can add a new drugs. The, way, the better way to look at this is that these are multiple phase three programs with a stopping hurdle in between. And that's the way the um, regulatory authorities like us to look at it. This is not phase two into phase three. It's a slightly different beast. These are multiple phase three, but have different um, adding and subtracting stages to them. And you can see, of course, that you get a few bites of the cherry. And if you set it up statistically, um, then it remains robust. So I saw that maybe the Stampede program in prostate cancer, which has now had five or six practice changing results from it. And prostate cancer, now and again, you might read reports in a very different way, place that it was 40 years ago, where there was really no treatment or very little treatment from the old fashioned hormonal treatments. And now it's a sort of multi pronged approach in prostate cancer. So I saw that and I thought, well, could we do that? in multiple sclerosis, and this, I suppose, is the genesis of the octopus trial um, in progressive multiple sclerosis. And I'll give you these, um, give you more detail on these stages as we go through. So some form of phase three outcome, some form of interim outcome. You must have a relationship between the two, clearly. So if you can affect the phase two outcome in a positive way, there's a chance, hopefully a good chance, you can affect disability. If you see no effect on the interim outcome, then we think there's little chance that you'll have an effect on disability at the end of the day, so you could drop that arm out. The stronger the relationship, the smaller the sample size. So these are not surrogates, but they move in the same direction. The higher the correlation, the smaller the sample size. So a well-known standard, if you like, um, outcome in progressive MS could be whole brain atrophy. It doesn't have to be. Could be a clinical measure if it moved in a timely fashion. It could be a biofluid marker if it moved in a timely fashion you had confidence in it. It could be amalgamation because the regulators don't really mind what you use at phase two because that's your problem. You know, if you throw out a drug and it was going to be good, that was your problem. If you bring a drug through and it's ineffective, that's your problem. They just really care about the phase three outcome. So what we're doing is to de-risk 
um, phase three. So here we go with a phase two outcome in progressive multiple sclerosis. I show this slide relentlessly, but this is someone in the MSTAT1 program. And we know, don't we, that we can quantify atrophy in registered scans over time. So in a two-year time period, that's a baseline. You can see the destruction of brain tissue. It, it dissolves. You know, the person in front of you, progressive MS, is right saying, well, what's happening? Well, your, your central nervous system is reducing in volume. And then we can quantify that. And this, as you know, in patients without disease, about 0.1, 0.2% per year. For those with progressive multiple sclerosis, it can be 0 0.7, 1.0, 1.2% per year. I've seen that. In Alzheimer's, about 2.0% per year. So you can quantify it. And it's a, it's a kind of integration of all the different processes. So it may be crude, but it's useful in trial design as a marker because it has a relationship to disability. It's not an exquisite MR technique, but you can't, in a multi-site setting, deploy an exquisite MRI technique because the variance is too high. You can't deploy PET scanning. A, it's highly expensive, but it's also maybe not available in more than one or two centers. So trying to get to the kind of gadolinium-enhancing lesions in relapsing remitting MS, or new T2, then brain volume changes is good enough. Hopefully, over time, we'll refine that, add in different things, all the rest of it. But it's kind of good enough. And you can deploy it in a multi-site setting. And so um, this is our paper earlier this year where we kind of laid out the sort of mathematics of design using this as the interim outcome and using a composite of nine-hole peg test, 25-foot walk, EDSS, and or as the disability outcome. So the details are there. And we, we looked at various familial trial, familiar trials to all of us. And then, happily not me, did some very complicated uh, modeling. And we had two questions. One is, is there a relationship? Is there a relationship to whole brain atrophy and disability? Because actually, it hadn't been written down anywhere. It was just thought. And, and yes, there is. And these are different trials. And secondly, well, what's, if you look at a trial design, it is indeed inconvenient to do lots of MRI scans on people, particularly from an academic standpoint. What's the shortage time period we think we could show an effect on brain volume? Because if it was six months in progressive MS, that would be excellent. But unsurprisingly, it's not six months. And we think the best you can do is about 18 months. And the variance declines down to about here. And so we put that together um, in our trial design process. So as I said at the beginning, we have no shortage of candidate drugs, candidate pathways. I don't understand these pathways, but I'm told they are the candidate pathways. Lots and lots and lots. Dozens, <laughs> dozens and dozens of different opportunities to have an effect on progression, which of course shows how complicated it is. The problem is, from all of these different drugs, these different pathways, this might take you 1,000 years or 500 years to put them through a phase three program. So in a funny way, we've been a victim of our own success because relentless molecular mechanisms are pumped out, but very few come to phase three. And so we have to, as I said, this could be one solution of trying to have a more efficient way of trialing our designs and getting there quicker. There's all sorts of, of, you know, very interesting, very interesting compounds are being produced. There is no shortage of compounds that might have an effect on progression. And so trying to sieve through this, again, is one of the very important parts of designing, because the fuel that you put in the engine, you really want to make sure 
to the best of your ability at that moment in time, that it could have an effect on progressive multiple sclerosis. And here's another list. And so a working group was put together by the UK MS Society to the best of people's ability, and a number of people in this room took part in that, sort of work your way down from a variety of criteria. Now, nothing is perfect, of course, and different diseases have done similar or different things or involve stem cells or all sorts. You've got to just do your best to try and pick out the candidates you think you have the most chance of success. This is a, we particularly wanted to repurpose medication because trying to, do, trying to take an, a brand new drug and do toxicology and all the rest of it, we didn't think that's where we were. But repurpose medication with good scientific rationale that you could put into, you start at phase two and move into phase three. And that's the uh, short list and familiar and interesting um, drugs that some of you will know about. So could, they, could some of these, one of these, be a drug that has an effect on slowing progression in progressive multiple sclerosis? Here's the you know, very exciting uh, metformin work uh, from the Cambridge group, for example. So I'm not going to tell you which drugs we've chosen for the Octopus platform because we just did working our way through the regulatory process. Um, but they will be from this list. And of course, we'd want to revise this list. We have a kind of horizon scanning program. It doesn't have to be academic compounds once we get going, open to commercial opportunities, biotech, whatever. It's whatever we think has the greatest chance of affecting slowing progression in progressive multiple sclerosis. So kind of inside the octopus program, um, well, we're very fortunate to have a robust set of trial sites in the UK. Um, a number of you are investigators in the MS STAT2 program. We'll be deploying these star in these different stages of the octopus trial. And really working together is a great joy, actually, because this is all very hard work, as you probably gathered for all of us. But the working together, the visiting sites, coming together, the united, um, united mission uh, is extraordinary. Um, exhilarating because we're trying to do something about the problem that faces us on a day-to-day -day. we're trying to take the best experimental science and put it uh, into action and even you know a covid pandemic didn't stop down for example the ms stat 2 the high dose simvastatin trial which recruited um, about a thousand patients and we hope to report that out we will report that out in about two years time so other mechanics, well, PPI is vital, and really we spend a lot of time co-designing, because this is not for our benefit, it's not for my benefit, for people with progressive MS. And so it's vital that they keep us on the straight, on the narrow, and they join a number of the committees, and they direct us, and they encourage us. We work together on communications and make sure they're all uh, robust and tight. And they provide the money. Octopus is funded by the UK MS Society, MS Stat 2, a third the UK MS Society, and a third the US MS Society. So vital. Other facts and figures, well, we would probably randomise about 125 people per arm, and then we keep it going and get to about 600 um, people per arm. So in the Octopus trial, we're looking to do a wide range of disability, from the EDS of 4.0, about 500 metres up to 8.0, a high age range, and of course people coming in on anti-inflammatory medication, if that's allowable from the NHS clinician. And as I said, entirely supported by the uh, MS Society of the UK, and these are the initial sites um, we're just working up. So, Organising a trial is very arduous. There are lots and lots of committees and subgroups that voluntarily do very hard work. And I'm intensely grateful for this because they don't have to do it. PIs don't have to give up their free time. A number of you are in the room. And it's, a, it's an amazing activity. This is the team um, that uh, 
works on the trial on a, on a daily basis, produces the database, for example, goes for all the governance structures, and these are many of the, the PIs with their different um, tasks for this. So again, inside the trial, well, how does it look? Well, I won't go through the detail, but we try and make it as an academic trial fairly straightforward. One advantage is doing academic trials is not being monitored for about five days by the commercial um, trial company that's organized in that trial. We try and make it kind of a light touch, but nonetheless, it has to conform to regulatory standards. And we measure a variety of clinical and patient reported outcome measures. And of course, other sub-projects can come in. We're interested in biofluid markers, advanced MRI imaging, and so on and so forth. A database is being produced, which will have the randomization program uh, within it. This is a non-trivial task to produce a database that's simple to use but efficient. And working very closely um, with the MS Register, the UK MS Register, um, which I think is a vital structure um, as part of the UK MS um, process so that people can put their initial expressions of interest through that. And we've made this uh, mandatory because we, we have learned through the trials that if a person, potential participant, can't enter their data, they're highly unlikely to survive a three to five years in trial. So it's really, really important and also as an efficient way of communicating and with people with progressive MS. Um, a variety of modern communication methods. I'm not very good at social media, but younger people are, and so we do all of that. So what were the challenges? Um, and I think this is the final slide. Even the simplest of repurposed drugs, surprisingly, can be very, very expensive. So clemenstein, for example, very attractive remyelinating drug, is very, very expensive when you come to deploy it in this process. Secondly, you had to go through enormous sort of university tendering process, which takes a lot of time and then you think you've got a company, and then they, they pull out on Christmas Eve. That was a particular disappointment last December. And then you have to start again. And then the contracting um, process, again, from a university academic side, when you have a small group of people, um, is very demanding. But nonetheless, uh, we move on and we get there. And really, I'd like to acknowledge certainly all of my colleagues at Queen's Square, but all of my colleagues um, in the UK and around the world and certainly we have opportunity, perhaps, to, to do this in Australia, for example, with Simon Broadley. So on that basis, I'd like to thank you for listening. If you see people with progressive MS, they can self-register. It is open. And then we'll see, as we go forward, how this turns out. Uh, one attempt uh, to reduce progression in progressive multiple sclerosis. Thank you. <laughs>